you give the benefit of the doubt to another being. You forgive them. Give up your hatred. That is called freedom. That is called love. Freedom, love, generosity, all the same word. So this is why letting go is nothing more than love. If you really love someone, you really let them go. So when they get, when they get so old, they're about to die, you know how much you love your father, your mother, your wife, or your husband. You know how much you love them by your ability to let them go, to free them. If you're grieving a wife or a husband, a son or a parent who's passed away, you're not loving them. You're not really grieving for them. You're grieving for yourself, for your own pain, not their pain. We never grieve for others. We grieve for ourselves, for our own hurt and pain. So real love is freeing. And this is an advice for you. If ever you are with a loved one in their last hours before they die, try and do this little ceremony called giving them permission to die. The first time I did this was in Perth, I don't know about how many years ago now, quite a long time ago now. I was counselling this young man, a Westerner, who was maybe about 33, 34, who was dying of cancer. He had his beautiful wife, Jenny. And I was in their little apartment, counselling them, trying to ease his physical pain from the death of his organs through cancer. He only had a day or two left. And as I was looking at them, I soon got an insight into what was going on and why he was taking so long for the final part of the journey into death. So I looked at his wife, Jenny, and I said, have you given him permission to die yet? Given Steve, his name was. And Jenny looked at me. She realized I'd hit the nail on the head. She smiled. She never said anything back to me. She climbed on the bed, put her hands around Steve, looked him right in the eye, and said, Steve, darling, I give you permission to die. It's all right. Don't hang on for me. And the two of them embraced and cried while I was just looking on. That was a wonderful time in the last, what it turned out, few hours of his life. As soon as his wife gave him permission to die, he felt free. He could let go of his struggle and go gently and gracefully into death and beyond. And to this day, when I counsel people who are dying, I also look for the people who are holding them back, the loved ones. Because you know what it's like if it's a husband, a wife, a son, a parent who's about to go. You don't want them to go. You're sad at their parting. So sad you are actually thinking of yourself. Quite naturally, but that's what you're doing. So, in order to free them, because they're hanging on for you, they're in pain because you won't let them go. So it's marvelous, it's wonderful, it's an act of final love to get up on their bed and say, darling, husband, wife, respected parent, I give you permission to go. Don't hang on for me. I let you go. It means that you allow them to release their mind from their decaying, dying body. And they can go so peacefully, so wonderfully. And it means afterwards, after they're dead, you've already done the first part of letting go. Letting them die. Now you can let them be cremated or be buried. You can let them go into their future life, always remembering them, but never carrying them around to the point of grief, the point of sickness and stress. 
too often we carry that dead person. We won't let them go. It means that we get sick with all sorts of diseases and cancers because we grieve a loved one. That we can't do our duties as a parent, as a child. We can't even do our business properly simply because we can't let them go. So love is letting them go. Selflessly, the time is up. Now is the time for you to go. And you go with my blessing. <laughs> I don't mean that for you. I mean when somebody's dying. So that's how to deal with someone who's dying. And actually there's another little story on that. It's in the little book. You may remember this story, but it's a fascinating story. That also happened when there was one of our monks when I was in Thailand. He was a Rhodes Scholar who became a monk. You know, we get some great people becoming monks. Monks aren't losers. <laughs> in fact, they're some of the most successful and even wealthy people or sons of wealthy people become monks. You know that, who's the richest person in Malaysia? What's his son called? Venu Siripanyo, yeah, he's at our monastery in Thailand. So he was at my monastery in Perth for a year, he's a great monk. Now his father is the richest person in Malaysia. He doesn't need to go to work on a Monday morning, ever. He doesn't need to go on arms round begging for his food, but he does it every day. He doesn't need to live in a small hut in the jungle. He could have a big condominium all to himself. He doesn't need to be celibate. He could have a harem. <laughs> but he's given it all up. Isn't that wonderful? So there's people who are doctors, PhDs, double MAs, it's amazing just the sort of people who become monks. They're not all losers. This was a Rhodes scholar. He was a monk with me in Thailand. But he got sick. He got two strains of typhoid at the same time. Apparently he told me that, I'm not sure if this is correct, doctors would tell me if it's right or wrong, there's only three strains of typhoid. He got two of them together. The very sick monk. He came very close to dying in Thailand. We sent him over to the United Kingdom. We sent him to this monastery to try and look after him. We did not spare any expense. Every type of medicine, the ordinary uh, medicine, homeopathy, allopathy, the only pathy we didn't give him was psychopathy. <laughs> <laughs> That's only a joke. Every type of medicine we gave him, but nothing worked. He just got sicker and sicker. And this was actually, he was living in this room in the attic of our monastery in Sussex for about three or four years. Could never get out of his room. On days he felt reasonably, the better days, he'd get out of his bed, walk to the door, that would exhaust him so much he'd be back in the bed for the next few months. He was really one sick man very often on the edge of death, but never actually dying. And after three years of exhausting every possible means of treating this guy, the abbot of the monastery, very wise monk, Aten Sumato, he had this wonderful insight. He went up to this monk's room, and just the two of them, this person who was once a rose scholar, not only a great uh, scholar, but also he was a champion wrestler as well. Very, very fit before, but now bedridden for about three years. He went up there into this dingy room and he looked over the bed of this forlorn, thin, so weak monk. And he said to him, I've come up here on behalf of all of the monks and nuns in this monastery and on behalf of all the lay men and lay women who support us on behalf of all your friends and relations as well. I've come up on behalf of everybody to give you permission to die. You can die if you want. Don't try so hard to live. And again, it was one of those moments where you see so deeply, have so much insight into the nature of the problem, 
that this Rhodes scholar just started weeping. He cried and cried and cried. Inside, he was trying so hard to get better. He was trying so hard to survive when these people had tried so hard to cure him. That was what was making him sick. From that time on, when he was given permission to die, he started to get better. And he's still alive to this day. (laughs) What brilliant psychology that was. You let it go. If you're going to die, die. And then you get better. (laughs) It works. So that's what we mean by letting go. Because when you don't let it go, there's stress. I've got to get better. I've got to survive. Because my loved ones won't let me go. And that is what makes you sick. Too much sickness comes from trying to get well. (laughs) You understand? Those of you who have been sick know what I'm talking about. Everyone who comes to visit you say, how are you feeling today? The most stupid question when you come and visit a sick person. (laughs) And that makes you feel even worse because you have to lie. At least bend the truth. I'm feeling a little bit better today. What that means is you feel awful but you don't want to tell them because it might upset them. (laughs) So when you visit the sick, never talk to the sickness. Talk to the person. Don't ask them how they're doing today because that's what the doctors and nurses ask them. (laughs) That's what we call letting go. Any other questions? There's only one question. Can I get two today? Anything from up to the top there, upstairs? You got a question? No. Okay. Any other question? Yes. Okay. (laughs) Yeah. The answer that we said that you're praying in some parts they pray to the Gautama the Buddha, sometimes they pray to Amitabha Buddha, should you let go of one of those? The answer is you should let go of both of them. (laughs) Because sometimes when you actually you pray to these things, that sometimes people actually ask, Does that work? when you ask for favours from a Buddha, and actually the, you know, the, the Buddha can't give you anything. But when actually you determine something, every psychologist knows that if you determine, you resolve upon something, then actually there's a chance you might get that. It's when you're praying to the Buddha, you're actually praying to yourself more than a, a lump of metal behind me. And when you t- this is like motivational psychology. You may actually go to a a top hotel, the Hilton, in KL somewhere, and you pay thousands of dollars to hear the same things you'll hear for free at Chempaka Buddhist Lodge on an evening when I'm here. (laughs) So you're very smart coming here because it's cheap. (laughs) But it's true that when you resolve upon something, you put it in your mind. I've already said it's called programming mindfulness. You're telling yourself what you want. You're... uh, teaching the mind what it needs to do and very often it works as long as it's a reasonable request. If it's not a reasonable request, of course it won't work. For example, some time ago somebody actually made this request. It was actually, there was his husband and wife, it was their 60th wedding anniversary. So they made this uh, puja, this offering to the Buddha and when they were actually, uh, after doing this, they almost heard this, this voice of compassion saying that, they heard it, whether it's from a Deva or the Buddha, who knows, but it said that you've been doing so much good karma over all these 60 years. You've been 
married together for so long time and both of you have been faithful. Because of that, whatever you wish, I will grant. And the woman actually said, she thought, we've worked so hard but most of our money has gone on our children and my husband still has to do his business. Can we become rich? Not very rich, but enough so we can retire so my husband doesn't need to go to work. And straight away, like magic, she saw this big pile of cash next to her. She got her money so she could retire. And it was her husband's turn. Sort of, um, what about you? And he said, well, now we've got enough money, but quite frankly, I'm a man. He said, you know, I'm, I'm not an Arahat, I'm not sort of enlightened, I'm not a monk. My wish is that I was married, that uh, my wife, that I was married to someone who is 20, you know, 40 years younger than me, instead of my old wife. And so straight away his wish was granted. Instead of being 80, he was 120. <laughs> That's a joke. <laughs> So sometimes we we wish for the wrong things. And if it's impossible, it can't be granted. So when actually you are making a determination in front of the Buddha, make sure it's a decent uh, determination. Not just for yourself. So you're not really praying to the Buddha to become wealthy. But you're praying to the Buddha to be happy in a good way, in a noble way, in a wise way. To be peaceful, to be content rather than just to to have worldly happiness. Because the Buddha is an unworldly person, so it could only give you unworldly things. Yeah, go on. (laughs) Go on, yeah. Okay, you're saying of the three major traditions, the Mahayana, the uh, Vajrayana, and the Theravada, that we've got the least amount of rites and rituals. We do the least amount of chanting, because that's because most of us monks are too lazy to learn all the chanting. (laughs) No, because those rites and rituals, they have developed over the, the centuries. So originally there were very, very few rituals and rites. Every now and again we develop new ones, like the chicken ritual, for actually <laughs> putting words, getting words back into your mouth, rotten words you said. But they're all, <laughs> they're all there for a meaning. So we try and keep the rituals less and less, and to keep the meaning more and more. So sometimes we do these rituals, but do you under, understand exactly what they're doing, what it means? Sometimes we do all these rituals. For example, I found out that in one part of um, Vajrayana, they do this black hat ceremony. And apparently the black hat from the, this holiness of Karmapa, all it was was a crown, which was given by one of the Mughal emperor, emperors, because the Dalai Lama and the Karmapa were vying for actually uh, being the, uh, the leader of the Tibetan kingdom. And one of them, you know, they, they put all of their support on one of the Mughal emperor, emperors. The other one put it on the other one. They were going to have a battle. The Dalai Lama's, um, uh, the one the Dalai Lama supported won. The one that Karmapa supported lost, which meant the Dalai Lama became the head of Tibet. But the crown which the Karmapa was to wear was called the black hat. And they made that a religious ceremony, even though it was secular in nature. So sometimes we have all these ceremonies and they get too much because we lost their meaning. Ceremonies are all right. They're important if we can remember their meaning. So it's the same as like the funeral ceremony. Sometimes we spend thousands of dollars on funeral ceremonies not really realizing what they mean. We don't need to do that. What happens is because you don't know what they mean, Because the person next door spent $10,000 on their father's funeral, you've got to spend $11,000. Otherwise you don't love your father, so you think. But it's not necessary at all. 
when you come to Buddhism, the, the ceremonies should be able to be explained. So the funeral ceremony, for example, is there for the person who's passed away to teach them Dhamma because they're still around. And it's also there for the people who left behind to teach them how to deal with death, how to deal with life. I've always noticed at a funeral ceremony, everybody is listening. They pay attention at that time. It's the same with a marriage ceremony. The reason we have a marriage ceremony is actually to make that commitment more real. When a boy and a girl just live together, when they don't make their commitment public in front of their relations and friends, it's not so meaningful. They don't tend to survive in their relationship so well. So that's why we have a marriage ceremony to make sure that they stick together a little bit longer than they would do otherwise. (laughs) And that's why that when I give my marriage ceremonies, they really stick together because I tell all those stories, the chicken and duck story (laughs) about the commitment. You all know the story about commitment that... Being involved as a boy and a girl just going out together, that's just involvement. When you get married, it's commitment. You know that story? The difference between bacon and eggs? Being just boyfriend and girlfriend, even just being engaged, is only involvement. When you get married, it's called commitment. The difference between involvement and commitment is the difference between bacon and eggs. In bacon and eggs, think about it. In bacon and eggs, the pig is committed. The chicken is only involved. (laughs) So I can't do this in Muslim marriages, but in (laughs) in Buddhist marriage, I say, let it be a pig marriage. You give everything. You give your life for that marriage, not just one little egg. (laughs) <laughs> so when I do those ceremonies you make them meaningful and because you make them meaningful it means those people which I marry the ones whose ceremonies I do they don't come and bother me later on because <laughs> they're happily married isn't that wonderful so there is a reason for ceremonies but they should be done meaningfully ok yeah, go on. One last question. There we go. Here we go. <laughs> There's a circular white light on his chest. Yeah. It's a <laughs> it must be actually a sort of when he goes back to his room, must be his headlights. <laughs> what is it? Sorry? But Davis, I haven't seen that photograph, but it might be sort of, it could be one of two things. It could be actually Davis lights, a supernatural thing, or it could be digital enhancing. <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 because I haven't seen it yet. But you know of all the supernatural powers which you can have, like seeing Deva's, hearing Deva music, being able to float through the air, being able to read people's minds. You know of all those supernatural powers. You know what the Buddha said, the only psychic power which he thinks is worthwhile showing other people. The only psychic power which the Buddha approved of. You know what that was? the psychic power of teaching the Dhamma. So, today you've seen the psychic power. (laughs) So may you all go back home and have a wonderful evening. (laughs) Okay, so let's share merits now. Idam me nyati nang ho tu sukita hon tu yata yo. Idam me nyati nang ho tu sukita hon tu yata yo. 
Itam men yati nang ho tu sukita hon tu yata yo sadu sadu sadu. And I talk tomorrow night. Tis the jhanas. So those who want to hear about really interesting stuff of the mind, jhanas is coming tomorrow.